It's time for the Money Puzzle Podcast with good conversations and realistic solutions to the money puzzles we all face every day. I'm your host, financial advisor, chartered financial consultant, and president of Edgen Insurance and Financial, Robert Edgen. Now let's get this show started. Hi there, hello, and welcome to the Money Puzzle Podcast. I am Robert Edgen, and I'll be your guide for the ride for the next few minutes. Each week, we look at a different piece of the money puzzle and practical ways to solve it so you can have the financial confidence you deserve and the future that you dream of. That's right. Here, I would normally stay in studio with me is Brian Johnson, yeah. my business partner, but we're actually in my hotel room at a conference down in Galveston, Texas. Right. Anybody know where Galveston's at? It's somewhere in Texas. Somewhere. Yeah. We we have sun for the first time today. First time in three days. On the beach, it's been nothing but fog and rain. Fog and rain. So, Brian, I know you love talking about investments, and today, this is episode number 45. We're not quite talking about investments, no. but we're talking about investment myths. Investment myths, yes. We have four of them today. We do. So, we're going to talk about, uh, are they real? Are they fake? How do you deal with them so that you can have the best possible outcomes for your investments? So we are, we're going to cover four different investment myths today, but I did have a couple that almost made the list that I thought oh, okay. I'd run by you. Oh no. And uh, see if you can tell me <laughs> okay. if they are uh, real or fake right. or if you've heard them before. What do you think? Let's do it. Okay. Myth number one that did not quite make our list is that you should only take financial advice from men if they have hair on their face. Brian, true or false? True. True. I also agree with that one. That one makes total <laughs> sense to me. Okay, myth number two that did not quite make our list is you should only invest money into the companies that feed you. <laughs> so if, I, for example, I I like Taco Bell, so I, right. should, I should only buy Taco Bell stocks. Th exactly. Okay. That's that's just ta also true. Taco stocks. Taco, taco stocks. stocks. Actually, I haven't eaten Taco Bell in about a yeah. decade. I, I would say... True. True. Okay. All right. I'm going to go with it. I don't, know. Right. I don't know. We didn't get a chance to research it. So, all right. Myth number three, the last one that did not quite make our list is the age old investment wisdom that you should invest in foreign currencies you can buy and hold like Iraqi dinars. <laughs> The official currency of Iraq. Uh, uh, Am I correct? That's, yeah, I, I think that's what it's called. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, so no. all right, we're not going to actually yeah. talk about any of those three, but we do have four that we need to get through, and there's some good ones. But yeah. before we do, I do a lot of reading and research, and we come across different headlines and news articles that catch my interest. So I thought we would take a minute to look at some news. All right, today's news article comes to us from Reuters, and the headline reads, Japanese billionaire Mizawa pulls out of dating show that promised the moon. Now, let me explain it real Was quick. Was it an actual moon? It's Yes. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, earlier this month, the 44-year-old billionaire announced he was seeking wow. single females over the age of 20 who were willing to go on a dating game show to become his girlfriend and travel to the moon with him oh. on Elon Musk's SpaceX. He was the very first, he'll be the first passenger on SpaceX to go to okay. the moon. Okay, all right. So, however, he had to pull, he had, get this, he had 28,000 applicants to be his girlfriend to go to the moon. Well, I think it was the billions, not necessarily the moon. Uh, either way, I, I mean, shoot. I, you, you would do it? If I say for billions in the moon, I, I might have applied to be his girlfriend. It sounds pretty exciting, yeah. except for the being his girlfriend part. So. <laughs> but unfortunately, he says uh, he's you know extremely remorseful, but he has to pull out because he is not feeling quite right. This guy, by the way, this is an interesting article because it also talks about he is uh, pledging to give away $9 million to Twitter followers as a social experiment to see how they use it to boost their happiness. Hey, I would do it for $9 million. So uh, he's just going to give that away. You don't even have to go anywhere. I know, just so, Twitter. So just, yeah, just Twitter. So here's the bad news. He is no longer seeking girlfriends and he's not going to take anyone to the moon with him. Oh. Uh, however, still an interesting article. If you want to check that out, I've got the uh, link directly below in the show notes. So make sure that you do. But for now, let's go ahead and get to today's hot topic. We've got four myths to get through to figure out are they true or false and how do we deal with them. 
Brian, what is the first so, investment myth? Let's start with the first one that I looked up. And the only reason why I did it is because of 2020. What is it? We're in an election year. Mm -hmm. So should you invest in an election year or should you avoid the stock market in an election year? What do you think? Uh, well, unfortunately, I know the answer you because do. you told me. However, you know, I, I actually, I really thought that it, that we would see a heck of a lot more volatility in right. election years. You know, everything that I've ever, um, you know, followed and read has pretty much been uh, how election years are maybe a, a time to get out of the markets for a few. Yeah, right. And the total opposite is true. When I mean total, going all the way back to 1952. Okay. So in this research, article, and this came from Pepperdine University out in California. This is extremely interesting. It says 1952, in the second year of the presidential election, so going after the first year, you in your second year, near the end of the second year of the first term, invested $1,000 over from 1952 all the way through 2000. How much did you make on a thousand bucks? Do you remember? Do you uh, remember, Mr. Roberts? I do not, but I'm guessing it was a decent amount. Seven thousand one hundred and seventy percent rate of return. Seven thousand percent. Seven thousand percent. So in every election year going up to it, you would you average well, say 1952, you made 35 percent. In 56, 45 percent. It's a big number. It's huge number. All the way down to 60% rate of return in 1996. So what was the worst rate of return? The worst rate of return was 16% in 1960. 16 being the worst being the rate worst. of return. That's but th this will blow your mind too. So if you would have pulled your money out of the market going into the election year, so you avoided every single election year, the same thousand dollars, the same thousand dollars, you would have had a loss in almost every single year. No kidding. No kidding. So your thousand dollars in all the way up to year 2000, remember investing a thousand dollars, you made 72, almost 73,000 bucks is what it had been worth on a grand. Okay. You would have got 643 bucks. So if you did not invest in the election year, you put a thousand dollars away, you yes. let it sit there for what, 60, 60 years? It, then and you lost yeah, four hundred dollars. You lost four hundred bucks. So all right. So is it a myth that you should not invest in an election year? That's a myth. That is a myth. Yes. Ab an absolute myth. And a lot of it has to do with what I was reading, especially going in, it doesn't matter who the president is or what party they're from, is going into that second term, the market's like certainty. They're hoping that things continue on as they were, that they've been doing well. And so that's why a lot of the changes are, are there. Well, and markets in general like certainty. Yep. You know, yeah. I mean, nobody likes volatility, it, although it does create opportunities, yeah. but certainty pushes the market forward. Yeah, that, that was a Pepperdine study. This one was in November of last year. November 2019, put up by USA Today. If you were invested in the election year, you would have averaged since 1952, 10.1%, according to USA Today. That's pretty spectacular. It, 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 amazing. So, yeah. I, okay. I didn't think that would have been the truth, but it is. So the averages and the history shows, and of course, history does not predict the future. It does not. But the history shows that pulling out of the markets in election years is a bad idea. Bad idea. So, okay, let's move on to myth number two, which I'm going to take, and that is the uh, age old investing wisdom that you should sell in May and go away. I yeah. think it was just because of a rhyme. So, well, it does sound good. It does. It's, <laughs> we know all good investment myths rhyme. Yeah, I so, guess. That's right. This is actually based on the theory that stocks underperform in summer months, which is May through the end of October, and then they overperform in the winter months. So why would they underperform in the summer? Is there a reason? Yes. Well, the thinking is, okay. you know, the warm weather, the summer vacations, kids uh, being out of school, all the extra activities, keeping people busy. There's just a lot less participation in the market. So is, is the participation rate in the marketplace versus the actual volatility? So, well, there's a lot less volume, a lot less participation, okay. which then in turn increases the volatility. Oh, uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. Now, it is true that between the years of 1950 and 2013, the Dow Jones had lower returns in the summer months than the winter months. In fact, May through the end of October averaged 0.3%. 
Okay. 0.3. Yeah, which is nothing. Compared to November through April, averaged 7.5%. Okay, so on the surface, it does look like yeah. you should sell in May and go away because of the extra volatility. Is it worth the 0.3? Should you take your six months per year off? However, there's always a however in life. There's always a, a however. There are a few reasons that you should not sell in May and go away. For example, not every year sees higher returns in the winter months and lackluster returns in the summer. Just a few years ago in 2016, the NASDAQ rose uh, 8% just from May through October. So pulling out in 2016, you would have missed out on that 8% return. But, but let's say that it every single summer, for hypothetical reasons, every single summer, it was a 0.3 return. Yep. What does that create for all of us would-be investors out there? Opportunity, so right because yes. if it, because what was what was the time frame for the big increase? Uh, May through October. No, oh, no the, the normal increase. ones yeah. November through April. So if you bought if you were able to buy a bunch of shares in the flat time mm -hmm. and then it went up seventeen percent, we'd be much better off. Well, that actually leads to my next point is okay. if you pull out and you don't invest May through October then you're missing out on the chance to buy low or buy dips or buy flat right. or use um, dollar cost averaging to increase your number of shares sure. that you own. So we've talked about dollar cost averaging, but basically what it is, quick reminder, is when you put the same amount invested into the same uh, investment product the same day of each month all year long, and statistically that gets you more shares of the investment at the end of the year. At, at, at a lower cost. So at a yeah. lower cost, right? Yeah, it's very so, interesting. Yeah. Just this last year, May of 2019, there was an article in Barron's where they examined the last 30 years and put the sell and man go away theory to test. The bottom line is there was only a 0.7% difference oh, in okay. selling and man going away. And that was before, or it was not including things like taxes that maybe happened, right. trading costs that okay. might have happened. And it assumed, you know, you don't get that dollar cost averaging. Right. So no extra investments. Okay. You know, so should you sell in May and go away? No. No. You know, statistically speaking, you are still better. It's not timing the markets. It's time in the markets. And if you're in dividend paying mm -hmm. funds or ETFs or stocks, you're going to miss a quarter, if not more, of dividends. So that's right. All right. So. Two myths down, both of them so far are busted. Right. What's myth number three? The third myth is bonds. Are bonds safer than stocks? I've definitely heard that before. Yes. Yep. And? So the answer is yes and no. Okay. Okay, here's why. What I was what I was got uh, thinking about and everything is how bonds work. If people know how bonds work with the market. Interest rates go up, bonds go down. Interest rates go down, the value of bonds go up. Right? It all yep. has to do with interest rates. So in today's market, we're at a crazy low interest rate. I mean, mm -hmm. look at some of the yields that have been taking place. So if we have a yield way down in the marketplace and interest rates start to tick up, well, mm -hmm. guess what happens? Well, and, and let's explain that real quick. Yeah. So, you know, what happens is, you know, it's like a pendulum, you know, yeah, bonds go mm -hmm. down as interest because what happens when you buy a bond and it provides a yield of, let's say, three and a half percent. That's right. Okay. And that's a guaranteed three and a half percent. And that yield means that they're going to pay you three and a half percent on your money, right. right? For a certain amount of time. Well, what happens if interest rates go to five percent? Why would anyone want a bond at three and a half? Yeah, I would so, not want your bond. I would want a new bond. That's right. At the five percent. So if you own the bond at three and a half percent, yours is now worth yep. less. So, so it gets discounted. Yes. Is typically what happens. So we are in a crazy low interest rate environment. So are they more risky or are they less risky than the stocks? A lot of times they are more risky than stocks right now. The other fact is inflation. Okay. As inflation rises, your your bonds become more risky. And we have really low low inflation historically. Mm -hmm. What 2.1, 2%, 2 yeah, something yeah. like that. Historically crazy low. So if you buy those bonds now and and inflation increases, right? Yeah. I, you'll be losing money 
on that bond because of the inflation rate on pricing. You're not getting the same return. Your 2% rate of return on that particular bond, as an example, is not going to buy the same stuff as it did this year, next year, as it did this year. Therefore, the risk in that bond continues to go up. So basically, if you have a 3% yield on right. your bond and inflation goes from 2% to 2.5%, you've lost a half percent yep. of purchasing power purchasing from power. that yield. That's right. Right? So, yes. Okay. So the myth, is it busted? It's yes and kind no. Of. Kind yes of. Yes and no. Kind yeah. of it is. It, it depends on the time frame and interest rates and inflation. So, okay, so that was a good one. So should you invest in bonds over stocks or stocks over bonds? Really, I think the answer is it depends on what the goals are. Right, it depends on what the goals are. Yeah, yeah it depends on your age, if you're needing income, and diversifying out your risk. Right, and it does, that's a big thing. You know, so is it safer than bonds? Well, yes and no. Right. Well, is it more safer risky? than stocks? Um, that's right, thank you. Is it, uh, you know, more risky than stocks? Yes and no, just yep. depending on what you're comparing it to, which is why it's a great reason to diversify yep. your portfolio. Absolutely. Okay. That leads me to myth number four, yes. which is the only things that you should invest in are low fee investments because fees are the most important thing. And investing with guys with beards. Yeah, well, that, of yeah. course, that's, an, that's a given. That is. Yeah, that's yes. a given. So now I'm not talking here about the fees that you pay your financial advisor uh, or that your advisor charges. We actually did a whole show on that in episode number 10 when we reviewed that Vanguard case study about advisor right. fees. So go check that out. That was very interesting. But we're talking about investing in things like an index fund, which has a lower cost than maybe a custom built portfolio full yep. of ETFs and individual stocks or bonds or things like that, right? Right. So yes, here's the deal. Fees are important. The less you pay in fees, then the more money you make. But you should always have a conversation with your advisor about the fees of whatever it is they're recommending. And you should try to find out three things. First, what are the fees going to be? Right. Right. You need to find that out. Two, is there an alternative that could be used to accomplish the same thing with less fees? Sure. Okay. And then the third is, are the fees worth it? You know, what is it about the investments that make the fees worth whatever the fees are? So give me an example. So an example is, um, well, before I get to an example, let me okay. let me go over one more thing, right? Um, sometimes you need to build a portfolio with certain types of investments for a specific goal, like maybe True. income distribution. Right. Okay, so here's the example. You might need to trade a little extra cost for some guaranteed income oh. returns, okay. okay? Such as um, an income producing annuity. Okay. okay. As an example, that's a tool that has a higher cost than an index fund, but what does the cost get you? Exactly. Right? right? Get you some guaranteed returns. Well, right. If if I got I don't know, $2,000 a month guaranteed to supplement my social security, that would be huge. Mhm. Mm so, yeah. And if you, and if that's what you need and the best tool to accomplish that happens to be an income annuity, then is an extra 0.4% worth it? Right. Yeah. I mean, with a guarantee, it is worth it. It's kind of like with Social Security, you got that guaranteed income. But what was the cost for you up front taking that money out of your paycheck for 40 years? So that's right. You know, the question to ask isn't, well, it, it is to ask what are yeah, the fees. Right. But the second follow up question is, what is my net return? Exactly. Right. You know, so, you know, would you rather have an investment that cost you one percent and then netted you two point five? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather have an investment that cost you one point five but netted you three point two? Right. Ultimately, it's just which one right. does better for you, yeah. which one helps you accomplish the goals. That's the number one. Which one helps you get to your goal better? That's right. Because costs might allow you to get some more complex investment strategies, right? Yep. Sometimes investing in a very um, highly managed, actively traded portfolio is needed for certain goals. Yeah. Those are going to have some extra fees. The question is, what is the net return and are those fees worth it? Right. Okay. So that's what you look at. So, okay. Pay attention to the fees, but pay attention to the big picture too. So I would say number four, you know, are should you only invest in the lowest cost fees? I'd say that myth yeah. is busted. You should yeah. invest in the product that accomplishes your goals. Yes. Right. And goals are number one. Goals are number one. So okay. 
Thank you for joining us in Galveston, Texas, in this wonderful hotel room. Brian, thank you for yeah, being here. Welcome. We're going to get back to the conference. That's it for this week. If you enjoyed the show, if you got something out of it, and if you know someone who needs to hear it, please share this with them. Make sure that you give us a rating on whatever podcast app you're listening to. And if you've got questions about your own money puzzle, email those to questions at yourmoneypuzzle.com. That's it for this week. Until next week, be safe, have some fun, and go do something to improve your money puzzle. Your future self will thank you for it. Registered representative of and securities offered through Securities Management and Research, Inc., SMNR. Member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through BFC Planning, Inc. Edgen Insurance and Financial Services, Johnson Financial Services, SMNR, American National Family of Companies, and BFC Planning are independent entities. There are risks involved with investing which may include market fluctuation and possible loss of principal value. Particular investments may not be suitable for certain situations. Carefully consider the risks and possible consequences involved prior to making an investment decision. Our firm does not provide legal or tax advice. Be sure to consult with your own legal and tax advisors before taking any action that may have tax implications.